When Meredith Chapman decided to interview Mark Gerardalt for a job, she didn't know what would happen next. Meredith, a successful 33-year-old marketing director at the University of Delaware, was recognized for her achievements in both academia and politics. She seemed set for a great career. When Meredith and Mark met in person for the interview, they immediately hit it off. Meredith hired Mark and they started working closely together. But there was a problem. Both Meredith and Mark were married. Over the following weeks, they grew closer and eventually became more than just friends. Mark, 48, had been married to his wife for 24 years and described his marriage as difficult. He had met his wife, Jen Eyre Cox, in 1986 when they were teenagers in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Then the two went off to college where they both pursued a career in marketing. They met again in the early 90s, and this time they started dating. The two had said they had been madly in love, and they got married in 93. Close friends of the couple noted that the marriage wasn't perfect. They described disagreements between the couple as intense, and was usually Janair, who was the victor of any argument. Janair had a big personality. She was outspoken and competitive, whereas Mark was more quiet, shy, and reserved. Money grew to be a constant issue for the couple. Janera worked for private companies in marketing, whereas Mark worked in colleges and universities. The 2008 recession decimated Janera's career, and she found herself unemployed and unhirable when most companies were scaling back. When things started looking up from the recession, Janera struggled to get back on her feet, bouncing from company to company. Mark's new job opportunity in Delaware saw the couple sell their house and move from South Carolina to the East Coast. Mark went first, leaving Janair behind to sell the house, and he started at his new job right away. While Janair was in South Carolina, Mark was in Delaware with Meredith, and things quickly started to heat up between the two. Janair joined her husband in Delaware, and had already been suspicious that her husband was having an affair. To confirm her suspicions, she sewed recording devices into Mark's pockets, eventually confronting him with the recordings of their conversations. She had 12 notebooks of handwritten transcripts from the recording devices, all of Mark's conversations. Mark and Janera began discussions about ending their marriage, where Meredith separated from her husband of nine years. Meredith got a new job in Pennsylvania and started making plans with Mark to be together. Janera's anger about Mark moving on with a younger, prettier, more successful woman than herself started to boil over. Mark said at one point Janera had threatened to throw herself out of a window. She met with a divorce counselor who noted it wasn't an unusual reaction, and she said that Janera shared feelings about being traded in and abandoned. Janera had been most concerned about where the divorce would leave her financially, but she also loved Mark and didn't want to separate. She wanted to work things out. No one could have predicted what was about to happen. On April 21, 2018, a neighbor of Meredith's in Radnor, Pennsylvania noted something odd. There was a woman with a grim, concerned or worried expression standing near her driveway. The woman was using binoculars to look in the direction of her new neighbor's home. The woman eventually got into a black SUV and drove off. She noted the incident as strange, but didn't think much about it, and didn't report the incident to the police or mention it to anyone until days later. Unbeknownst to Mark, Janera went out and purchased a gun. She started going to shooting ranges near their home. Mark and Janera had agreed to meet for dinner to go over some things regarding their soon-to-end marriage on April 23rd. Mark arrived at the restaurant and waited, but Janera never showed up. He then started receiving concerning text messages from Janera like, he then became increasingly concerned when Meredith didn't answer her phone and decided to go over to her house. He had prepared for some sort of altercation or confrontation with the two women. He wasn't prepared for what was at the home. He discovered the bodies of Meredith Chapman and Janera Gerdo. Janera had meticulously planned the murder for weeks. She had placed a GPS tracking device on both Mark and Meredith's vehicles. She placed an app on Mark's phone that duplicated everything he did, mirroring it onto her phone. In the SUV she had rented, there had been binoculars, latex gloves, ammunition, and a wig. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. 
we've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. Bill Hall Jr. was born in July 1963 in Behar, Texas. He met Francis in high school and the two started a relationship where they fell madly in love. The two married at 18 and started their lives with very humble beginnings. Bill worked for his aunt at a trucking company while Francis worked odd jobs. The two started a family right away, first a daughter and then a son and the family was very happy. Bill had always wanted to be a successful entrepreneur and gave his kids the world. He learned the trucking business from the ground up, and in the early 80s he and Francis bought their first truck and started Bill Hall Jr. Trucking. In under a decade, Bill and Francis grew the company into a multi-million dollar empire, becoming the largest trucking company in Texas. From the outside, Bill and Francis had an unwavering marriage. They ran their company together, raised two kids into adults, had a beautiful home, and seemingly had an amazing life. However, those closest to Bill knew the marriage wasn't perfect. Bill had a larger-than-life personality and liked to throw around money when he went out with his friends, which attracted a certain crowd. Bill loved going to Las Vegas, partying, and women. This had been an ongoing issue in his marriage, but Frances seemed to stick by Bill through it all. She stated that she loved him and had been willing to work it out. One of his affairs is what ultimately led to his death in October 2013. Bill had met Bonnie Contreras, a former exotic dancer, and for three years Bill carried on with a double life. Bill showered Bonnie with expensive gifts, painter rent, binary vehicles, vacations, and plastic surgery. Bonnie, who was 28 when they met, was nearly half Bill's age. Bill and Bonnie had a rocky relationship. They had broken up several times for a multitude of reasons. Sometimes it was Bill's marriage, sometimes it was Bonnie's temper. She had said that Bill told her he would divorce Francis so that he could marry her and have children. But after waiting for years, this seemed less and less likely. Bill's friends said that he'd lost interest in Bonnie in 2013, the relationship was too much of a roller coaster for him, and he ended things. In a text message, Bonnie sent several messages threatening to tell Francis about the affair. According to Bill's close friends, this had been a common Bonnie when she wasn't getting her way, but this time it didn't work and Bill continued to ignore her. This caused Bonnie to call Francis and tell her about the affair. Not only that, but she also started sending Francis explicit photos and videos of her with Bill. Francis and Bill had a full blown out argument. Francis fully admits that she broke Bill's phone and several decor items in the house that had been smashed from Francis throwing them. She said that she'd been hurt by the angry and betrayed. This also prompted a war of words between the two women. Both sent vitriolic messages back and forth and this went on for weeks. According to Francis, she'd had enough and told Bill to leave. And when he left, he went back to Bonnie. On October 10th, 2013, several calls were made to a Texas 911 dispatch reporting that two SUVs were racing on a two-lane highway. Minutes pass when other calls start coming in saying that a man driving a motorcycle needed medical attention and had been hit by an SUV. Upon arriving on the scene, authorities found that Bill had been thrown from his Harley Davidson. Bill hadn't been wearing a helmet, so he suffered extensive head trauma. While being rushed to the hospital via helicopter, Bill died at 50 years old. Officers began investigation and soon learned that the victim's wife and mistress were and his wife had vehicle damage that was consistent with an accident. Francis was arrested and taken into police custody. While talking to the police, Francis said that she was returning from a niece's volleyball game when she passed her husband Bill on his motorcycle, and then moments later, noticed the vehicle that Bill had just purchased being driven by a woman who she had assumed was her husband's mistress. Francis claimed she only wanted to confront Bonnie and tell her to leave her alone and turned around and attempted to follow them. Of course, Bonnie's story is quite different from Frances' story. She said that Frances proceeded to hit her in the back of the vehicle with her vehicle at least 15 times. At some point during this encounter, Bill got in between the two vehicles, and that is when Frances hit him from behind and still pursued Bonnie. 
Francis continued to contradict Bonnie's story. She claimed it was an accident. Francis states that she was trying to pull Bonnie over to confront her about the constant harassment. She then stated that Bill was in front and he had let two vehicles pass him. Francis said that Bonnie hit the brakes and this caused a chain reaction that caused Bill to make contact with Francis' vehicle. It appeared that Francis had sideswiped Bill and that he veered off the road and went over his bike's handlebars, hitting the pavement. Francis maintains that she didn't know Bill had been run off the road or had collided with her vehicle. She said she saw dust and couldn't see Bill's bike anymore. And when she couldn't see him, she turned around. Francis was charged with murder and held without bail. She found out Bill had died while detained. At the trial in 2016, an expert testified that Bill did indeed strike Francis' rear window trying to avoid a collision. He said nothing on Francis or Bill's vehicle indicated any foul play, that it was merely an accident. However, a jury thought differently and sentenced Francis to concurrent sentences of two years each, one for the murder charge and the other for the aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge. Francis was released from prison in 2018. In an interview with News 4 San Antonio, Francis stated, Did I murder my husband? No. I can't even bring myself to say that word. Did I go after her and want to confront her? Yes. And that I regret for the rest of my life. I've paid my debt to society. I've done my time. She also went on to say that she would like to someday be an advocate for women who were imprisoned. When Samantha Stewart, 27, didn't answer her family's calls and texts for days, they got really worried. On July 17, 2018, her brother went to her apartment in Queens, New York, to check on her. Sadly, he found her naked body wrapped in a sheet on her bedroom floor. Her tongue was out and all her teeth were knocked out. Samantha worked as a nurse at a hospital in Long Island and was a role model to her siblings. Her family was devastated by her loss. When the police came, they didn't see signs of forced entry. They said Samantha had injuries to her neck and head and later determined she died from strangulation. The main suspect was Samantha's date, who was caught on camera leaving her place the night she died. A week later, police found the suspect, Daniel Drayton, in a hotel in Los Angeles. He was 31 years old and originally from New Haven, Connecticut. According to police reports, he had a lengthy criminal record prior to Samantha's murder, which included jail time for strangulation and harassment. Samantha had met Drayton after they matched on Tinder. The pair went on a date on July 16, 2018, and later that night returned to Samantha's apartment, where Drayton beaten strangled her to death. He was seen by surveillance cameras getting into a white van that was later found abandoned at JFK Airport the next day. He had stolen Samantha's credit card and used it to purchase a plane ticket to California. When law enforcement apprehended him in a North Hollywood hotel room, he was holding another woman against her will and had sexually assaulted her. He was taken into custody by the LAPD and was charged with premeditated attempted murder, forcible sexual assault, and false imprisonment by violence. The New York Daily News interviewed Drayton while he was being held in a Los Angeles jail. He told them he suffered from schizophrenia and bipolar II disorder. He admitted that he remembered killing Samantha after a date. He said that he liked her, but the voices in his head told him she had to die. Drayton claimed that these voices used direct energy weapons on him to control his mind, making him unable to defy them. Investigators believed he was playing the insanity card in order for his defense. At one point, they also thought he may have been a serial killer using popular dating sites like Tinder to lure his victims. Because during his interrogation, Drayton admitted to killing six more women, two in Connecticut and four in New York. But as of now, investigators haven't been able to find any proof of these claims. At the time of Samantha's murder, Drayton was free on a $2,000 bail while he was awaiting trial for a case in the Nassau County, New York. He had been charged with choking his former girlfriend, Zania Barney, after she tried to end their relationship. He had been released 12 days before he murdered Samantha. In that case, the judge who released him didn't know that Drayton had a criminal record in his home state of Connecticut, dating to at least 2011. Samantha's death was attributed to missing paperwork and a lapse in communication. 
Drayton was extradited from California to New York, where he was arraigned on several charges. The charges included murder in the second degree, grand larceny in the fourth degree, petty larceny, sexual misconduct, identity theft, unlawful possession of personal identification, and criminal possession of stolen property. This time, Drayton is currently being held without bail, and if convicted, he will face 25 years in prison. Queen's district attorney commented on the case saying, this was a brutal crime that makes every person using a dating app fearful. The victim was duped into going out on a date with a defendant who played a charmer online but was in fact an alleged sexual predator. The defendant is accused of brutally beating and then killing this innocent woman in her home. After this heinous act of violence, the defendant fled the state to escape prosecution. Now back in our custody, this defendant will be held to account for his alleged actions. The NYPD believes there may be other women out there that spoke to Drayton online or met up with him. They're asking anyone with information to call them. Daniel Drayton at this time doesn't have a court date set, but let me know if you want further updates on court appearances. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. 24-year-old Sydney Loof left her job at the local Maynard store, where she was a cashier, for a Tinder date with a woman named Audrey. Sydney really liked Audrey and talked to her friends about her. She even showed Audrey's picture to her best friend, Brooklyn McChrystal. On their date, Audrey picked up Sydney from work, and they spent the night driving around and smoking weed. According to Audrey, she dropped Sydney off at a friend's house later that night. But the next morning, Sydney didn't show up for work, which was unusual. She also didn't respond to texts from her mom and friends. Her last online activity was a Snapchat photo with the caption, ready for my date. Sydney's mom, Susie, reported her missing and the police went to her rental home the next day but couldn't find her. There was no sign of a fight and Sydney's car, glasses, purse, and her cat were all left behind. Her cat was unfed which was unlike Sydney. Meanwhile, the owner of a duplex complained about a strange smell of bleach coming from the basement rented by an odd couple. Additionally, he found it strange that the couple had an air conditioner going in the cold month of November. The couple was 55-year-old Audrey Trail and 28-year-old Bailey Boswell. They told the landlord that they were engaged and worked as antique dealers. Little did he know that was just the tip of the iceberg. Trail and Boswell were involved and later convicted of scamming a Kansas couple out of $400,000 over some counterfeit coins, and they claimed to be leaders of a vampire sex cult. According to women involved in the cult who later came forward, Audrey called himself he told them that he had gained his powers through killing and torturing people, and if they wanted to possess special abilities like him, they would also have to kill people. On the other hand, Bailey considered herself a witch with healing powers. Most of the women they met and recruited were through Tinder. Bailey was always the one that they would match with. Every time she matched with a new candidate, she would use a different name, one of which was Audrey. She'd tell them about Daddy Aubrey and the occult. Aubrey also liked to call himself the master and considered himself a sugar daddy as he would give the women in his group a weekly allowance of $2,000 to pay for all their needs. However, he had rules. Those women had to call him daddy or master and Bailey was either mommy or mistress. They weren't allowed to be with any other man and had to check in with him through text or call every three hours. They had to ask permission to do anything, even if it was as simple as drinking water or using the bathroom. They also had to help the couple steal and sell antiques and partake in group sex. If any of the women broke any of the rules, she would be whipped or choked with a belt by Bailey, aka the Queen Witch. One of the women later testified that Trail and Boswell brought up killing and torturing people often. She said that she told her that they needed to kill to get powers. She said Boswell talked about cutting out people's eyelids and pouring acid on them. She also said that Trail once showed her what he called Bailey's killing bag. It contained a sauna suit, a hammer, and a pair of pliers. Investigators found a sauna suit in rural Clay County, where Sidney Loof's body was later found. After Sydney went missing, Brooklyn McChrystal set out to find out what happened to her best friend. 
She made a Tinder profile similar to the one that Sydney had and swiped left on one Tinder profile after another until she finally stumbled upon Audrey's profile. She swiped right and messaged Audrey, who responded by sending her phone number, which Brooklyn immediately gave to law enforcement. On a call with the police, the so-called Audrey told them she had dropped off Sydney at a friend's house and she hadn't heard from her ever since, and she refused to come to the precinct for questioning. Days later, investigators were able to pin down the Wilbur duplex as the last place where Sydney's phone had pinged. The pungent smell of bleach immediately caught their attention when they searched the basement where Trail and Boswell lived. On November 28th, Boswell and Trail were considered persons of interest. They responded to the declaration by making a Facebook live stream in which they maintained their innocence by saying that they had nothing to do with Sydney's disappearance. On November 30th, they were arrested in a Missouri motel and brought back to Nebraska on a fraud indictment. Items found in their motel room revealed that they were planning to flee to Mexico. On December 5th, search teams led by the FBI finally found Sydney's remains. Her body was dismembered and cut into 14 pieces, some of which were never found. The remains were wrapped in trash bags and scattered among multiple ditches down two different roads in Clay County, approximately an hour west of Wilbur. Even before running the DNA analysis, investigators were confident the remains belonged to Sydney, based on a tattoo on one of her arms saying, everything will be wonderful someday. This detail is especially heart-wrenching because Sydney had been suffering from severe depression for many years. She'd only started feeling better and getting her life back on track when her life was cut short by two deranged people. After the arrest, Trail confessed that he and claimed that Bailey was innocent. In his confession, he revealed that they killed Sydney because she had rejected their lifestyle and was a threat to their group because she had said she was going to expose them. Bailey and Trail exchanged several ciphered letters during their incarceration before the trial. The detectives deciphered the codes, showing Trail taking full responsibility for the crime and telling Bailey to say that she was a forced participant despite that being untrue. The letters later played a significant role in condemning Bailey. On June 11, 2018, Boswell and Trail were charged with murder in the first degree and improper disposal of human remains. The prosecutor expressed their plans to seek capital punishment. At one of the court appearances, Trail lashed out saying, Bailey is innocent. I curse you all. Then he slashed his throat with a sharp object. He missed a significant part of the trial, but made a full recovery and attended sentencing. The prosecution presented evidence against Boswell and Trial. On November 15th, surveillance cameras showed the couple shopping at Aardvark Antique Mall, where they bought a folding saw, a weeder, and food grinders. Shortly after, cell tower data for both suspects' phones showed that they were waiting near Sydney's residence before her departure to work, and they appeared to have followed her to Maynard's. While Sydney was at work, Home Depot surveillance tapes showed the duo buying a footlong hacksaw drop cloths and sharp utility knives with backup blades. Other surveillance recordings displayed Boswell and Trail purchasing a tree saw, 30-gallon trash bags, and a couple of gallons of Clorox bleach before and after the murder. With all the evidence against them, it took the jury only hours to reach a guilty verdict. Trail spoke at a sentencing hearing where he was ultimately sentenced to death by lethal injection. Boswell was sentenced to life in prison as it was deemed by a panel of judges that Boswell's crimes didn't meet the judicial threshold for capital punishment in the state. On July 9, 2012, Amber Duncan Wilson was out with her friends in Linden, New Jersey. Amber had just graduated high school with honors. The cheerleader had also hoped to pursue a career in criminal justice. She had full scholarship in September at St. Peter's University. She wanted to make a difference in this world and become a state trooper. A classmate said of Amber, she was always so nice. She never treated anyone differently because of her status as a cheerleading captain. She was always the most helpful person on the team. She always made sure if you didn't understand something, you could come to her. Amber was heading home with a friend and the two had decided to stop in at Dunkin' Donuts to grab a snack. While they were walking there, they were approached by a person. The two were robbed and words were exchanged. The girls only had their cell phones and a couple of dollars in cash. Suddenly, Amber was shot point blank, killing her almost instantly. Her family has been devastated by this tragedy and is asking for help from the public. 
to get justice for Amber's murder. In a statement to the media, Union County Prosecutor Daniel Wilson said, Emmis, Wilson Duncan was a young, ambitious woman who had a meaningful life ahead of her. Sadly, that life was senselessly lost at such a young age. And we remain as firmly committed today as we did 10 years ago in finding this cold-blooded killer and bringing justice for her and her loved ones. There's a $10,000 reward for any information that leads to an arrest. If you have any information, you are asked to call the Union County Crime Stoppers. On October 24, 1985, two hunters stumbled upon a significantly decomposed body in a marshland area in Newark, California. According to the Newark Police Department, her body was barely recognizable by the time she was found. At the time, police were able to establish that the victim had been shot. They were unable to establish exactly when she died due to the conditions of the marsh, but it could have been anywhere from two months to one year prior to her discovery. Police were limited in what they could determine, so they turned to forensic anthropologists for a more precise profile of the Jane Doe. With careful analysis of her skeletal remains, they determined that she had been between 5 feet 6 inches and 5 feet 8 inches and had brown and auburn shoulder length hair. She was estimated to have been between the ages of 25 and 36 when she died. And her bottom two front teeth were missing from her remains and had likely been missing for some time. As the two teeth next to them had been growing at an inward angle to close the gap. This is a distinguishing feature that police believe people who knew her would have recognized and that anyone who had been looking for her would be able to identify her by. The only items found on her were a hair barrette, a watch, earrings, and a ring on her pinky finger, but no identifying items like a wallet or purse were recovered from the scene. For nearly 40 years, no one has come forward to identify her. Her identity and her murder have remained a mystery all these years. Then, just a few years ago, her case was reopened, and when new technology allowed forensic scientists to extract DNA from hair strands taken from the victim, advanced DNA analysis might be able to potentially match her to relatives. To find matches for the victim, the New York police partnered with the DNA Doe Project, a nonprofit that builds and uses genetic information to identify John and Jane Doe's. Volunteers from organizations like this have solved dozens of unidentified persons' cases around the country. The DNA Doe Project ended up finding a potential mother match for the unidentified Jane Doe, a woman named Marianne Mary Richardson, from a small town in Missouri. Unfortunately, she is no longer alive, which has led to a dead end for the lead. They went on to pursue another lead, a relative in Texas, who was determined to be a potential half-sister of the victim. That half-sister, Ruth Ellis, however, had been adopted as a one-month-old and does not know her biological family. Investigators believe that their Jane Doe had been adopted as well in the late 1940s, causing her to end up in California. So far, adoption records have not turned up any additional clues. Despite these promising leads, the adoption has complicated the investigators' DNA angle, and the Newark Jane Doe remains nameless and unclaimed by relatives or loved ones. A reconstructed image of what she likely would have looked like is newly available, and investigators hope someone will see it, who recognizes her and comes forward to solve this mystery once and for all. It was just after midnight on January 31, 1994, when 26-year-old Diana Alt was found dead on the floor in her home in Independence, Missouri. She and her children had been at a Super Bowl watch party and had arrived home later than usual. The killer, who had broken into their home in their absence, shot Diana at close range in the side of the neck as she walked down the hallway towards the kitchen. Her two children, ages four and seven months, were in the house with her at the time she was killed, were too young to call for help. That night, Diana's red Pontiac was discovered in a nearby church parking lot by police when neighbors called to report suspicious activity. Inside the vehicle, authorities discovered a revolver, ammunition, and shell casings. The car had been left with the key in the ignition, still running. Given this alarming discovery, they immediately rushed to Diana's home, where they found her body. Although no one has ever been officially identified as a suspect, Investigators did uncover what they believed to be a connection between Diana's murder and the 1989 stabbing of 18-year-old Sarah Dillon in Kansas City. A woman named Carolyn Heekert, who had an affair with Diana's husband, 
had also dated Dylan's boyfriend. Kiekert was charged with both crimes, but a judge ended up dismissing her charges due to lack of evidence. But this March, police announced that they would be reopening her case. Diana's family is hoping they will finally receive the answers they've been hoping for all these years. According to Lauren Freeman, a detective with the Independence Police and a member of the FBI's Violent Crimes Task Force, her team is cautiously optimistic about the case. She confirmed that they are following several new leads, but are not able to confirm what those leads are at this time. Diana's family and friends are hopeful that these new leads will bring justice to Diana's murder. This June, investigators announced they will take a fresh look at the 1986 murder of Ivan Darling in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It was Christmas Day when a relative visiting from Maryland arrived at Ivan's house to take him for a family dinner. When she arrived, she made a shocking and sad discovery. 79-year-old Ivan Darling had died, and he clearly not died of any natural causes. Ivan had sustained numerous puncture wounds and had likely died of blood loss from those wounds, according to Gettysburg police. The murder weapon remains unknown, but the puncture wounds it created were likely left by a small knife. According to investigators, he appeared to have died two to three days prior to his discovery. The motive in his murder is believed to have been a robbery as several items were missing from his home. Despite police following numerous leads after the murder, none turned up anything substantial, and a suspect has still never been identified. The case has gone cold, but in late June, District Attorney Brian Sennett announced that the Adams County DA's office would be taking a fresh look at the 1986 murder of Darling. Sennett and his team are optimistic that new technology and advances in DNA profiling may allow them to explore new leads that could not previously be obtained. Deborah and Simcala, it was September 26, 1981 on Father's Day, when 22-year-old Deborah and Simcala was found dead in her home in Brisbane, Australia. Her roommate discovered her body in disturbing circumstances before contacting the police. Deborah had been found in her kitchen. The upper portion of her body had been placed inside a gas oven. The gas knob on that oven had been turned on and two small fires had been set in other parts of the house. But Deborah had not died of smoke inhalation or carbon monoxide poisoning. She had been strangled with a dog leash, which remained hanging around her neck when police arrived at the scene. Police soon speculated that Deborah's killer had attempted to set fire to the house and destroy the evidence, perhaps even making it look as if the victim had died in a fire. This was indicated by the small fire set in other rooms and by Deborah being positioned partially inside the oven, presumably so she would catch on fire quickly. This May, police launched a fresh public appeal for new information leading to Deborah's killer offering $500,000 reward for information leading to the identification and conviction of the person or persons who murdered Deborah. On the day of her death, Deborah was seen in her yard with a young man around 4 p.m. He appeared to be in his early 20s with dark hair and a slim build. Then later that evening around 7.30 p.m., someone noticed two people sitting on the front porch of their home. A description of them was not provided. Detectives are hoping to speak to any of these three individuals or anyone who has information about them. The Queensland police are confident that there are individuals out there who know something and can provide crucial information regarding the case. They are hopeful that the new significant reward will encourage those to reconsider reservations they may have previously had. After 40 years, it's time for Deborah's loved ones to know what happened to her on that terrible night. In October of 2000, just a few months shy of his 24th birthday, Alondo Julio Adams was shot and killed in his home in Norfolk, Virginia. For 22 years, Alondo's family has been left grappling with uncertainty, wondering who killed their lovable son, brother, and young father. His case has gone cold, but just this year it's been reopened. According to Detective Jonathan Smith, who is now leading the homicide investigation, reopening the case all these years later makes sense, even after Alondo's old apartment complex has been knocked down, destroying any forensic evidence that might have remained inside. The hope is that people may have information that they were too afraid to share in the past, but would be willing to share now. Alondo was in his apartment on Virginia Beach Boulevard when two unknown men knocked on his door. Alondo apparently did not open the door, but one of the men fired a shot at him through the door. He was shot and killed in his own home, 
Lana's family says that they do not know of anyone who disliked him and can't think of a reason someone might want to hurt him. The case remains unsolved 22 years later, and police continue to pursue new leads. I would be remiss if I did not remark on just how little information there is about this case, especially in comparison to other cold cases that I have covered. Media interest in this case seems to be nearly non-existent and is limited to only local news stations. Considering the case was just reopened in May of this year, there should be a flurry of coverage, but as a black man, Alondo's case has clearly been overlooked and deprioritized all these years. Media outlets, law enforcement agencies, and internet sleuths alike need to treat cold cases involving all victims with the same importance as any other case. It's sad that this even needs to be said, but the bias is clear and this pattern needs to change. On August 10, 2022, 26-year-old OnlyFans model Courtney Clinics was arrested and charged in connection with the death of her boyfriend, 27-year-old Christian Toby Abaisili. Christian had been stabbed in the luxury condo they shared in Miami on April 3, 2022. Cleanings had claimed she had acted in self-defense and had been released pending the investigation. She was arrested in Hawaii, where she was undergoing treatment for substance abuse and PTSD. Miami State's attorney, Catherine fernandez Rendell held a press conference after Cleaning's arrest and revealed some of the evidence that had led them to believe that Cleaning's hadn't been truthful about what had happened that night. Courtney and Christian met in November 2020. The two had a tumultuous relationship and they'd been on and off again throughout their entire relationship. Both Texas natives, the two had immediately hit it off. Initially, his family liked Courtney, but they also noticed that soon after their relationship started, Things between the couple weren't always good. They revealed that they believed that Christian isolated himself from the family and his friends. Clenings had been previously arrested for domestic violence in Las Vegas. In July 2021, she admitted to throwing a glass at Christian's head, and hotel security had been called. The charges were dropped, and she was eventually released. At Clenings Miami condo, the couple had numerous complaints from neighbors and building security about fights with the couple. So many, in fact, that Clenings had been served an eviction notice because security was tired of dealing with the constant issues. The state's attorney released this video, which is Cleanings assaulting her boyfriend, taken only weeks before Christian's murder. Rundle said that it was one video of numerous that had been pulled from the building's security cameras. She revealed that additionally, their neighbors had taken to filming the couple whenever they were fighting outside the building or on their patio. All of this evidence, which hasn't all been released yet, as it will be trial evidence, shows that it was Courtney Cleanings who was the aggressor, not Christian Abbasili. They also revealed a timeline of what happened based on evidence which doesn't align with statements Courtney made. On April 3rd, it seemed like a normal day. The couple filmed themselves playing with their dogs and hanging out at home. Christian is seen leaving the building around 1 p.m. and he returns at 4.33 p.m. Phone records show that while he was gone, Courtney had remained in the apartment where she did an Instagram live, and then she called him twice while he was gone, once at 4 and once again as he entered the building. In surveillance, Christian seems calm and relaxed. He's carrying two Subway sandwiches and everything seems completely ordinary. Shortly after Christian walks into their unit, Calls to 911 from surrounding neighbors start to trickle in about loud screaming coming from Clenning's unit. At 4.43 p.m., phone records show that Clenning's called her mother and they had a six-minute conversation. They end the call and Clenning's calls her mother again and then they speak for another seven minutes. At 4.57 p.m., Cleaning calls 911 where she requests an ambulance because her boyfriend had been stabbed. In the 911 call, Christian was heard in the background saying, I'm dying with cleaning saying, I'm so sorry, baby. Cleaning was found covered in blood. Christian had a single stab wound in his chest and the knife had severed a major artery near his heart. He was rushed to the hospital, but his injuries were too severe and too much time had passed and he later died. Cleaning was taken into custody that evening under Florida's Baker's Act, which is a mental health crisis prevention method for people who are believed to be at risk of harming themselves. In the days following Christian's death, she wasn't arrested or charged with anything regarding the stabbing. Clenning gave inconsistent statements regarding what had happened that night. 
She first claimed that Christian had attacked her when he entered the apartment and choked her. She said that he let her go and then she went to the kitchen, grabbed a kitchen knife, and threw it from about 10 feet away. The coroner determined that the six-inch knife had, with great force, been plunged into Christian's chest from an upward angle. They also stated that there wasn't any plausible way for the injuries to have occurred in the way that cleanings had stated. Because the knife had gone in at an angle, the knife would have had to come from above Christian. Clenning had also waited 12 minutes before calling 911. Blood evidence showed two large pools of blood where it looked like Christian fell and then had tried to crawl out of the apartment before ultimately stopping. Clenning had also started to receive text messages from her mother after her arrest saying, remember to claim it was self-defense and advised her not to say anything without an attorney, which would suggest that Clenning's had attacked Christian and then called her mother about the situation before calling 911. Additionally, Clenning didn't have any injuries to corroborate her story. No bruises, no defense injuries. There wasn't any evidence to back up her telling of what had happened that night. Christian's family was incensed that Clanings was released without any charges laid. Their lawyer in a statement to the media claimed that Claning was receiving special treatment as a white woman. If roles had been reversed, their lawyer claimed that Christian would have been arrested and held without bail while awaiting further court proceedings where Cleanings was released and seen at a bar the day after Christian's death. Cleanings lawyer has gone on the defense to say that Christian was, in fact, the abuser, and the video evidence presented by the state's attorney only shows a victim of domestic violence defending herself. Her lawyer also said that, and Courtney will be seen for what she is, a victim of domestic abuse that survived her abuser. Keep in mind that in this case, there has been a four-month investigation into Christian's death, and they didn't immediately charge Courtney Clenning. The state's attorney wouldn't have taken this case if there wasn't overwhelming evidence to suggest that Clenning's had been the aggressor in the relationship. Currently, Clenning is waiting extradition back to Florida. Where she will be charged it is anticipated that she will plead not guilty and a trial will be set. At this time, she was denied bond as well. 53-year-old Jack Chun from Irvine, California had been experiencing severe gastrointestinal distress for a few weeks. The radiologist went to see a doctor and was diagnosed with stomach ulcers, gastritis, and inflammation of the esophagus. The serious medical issues had come out of nowhere. Jack said he'd never experienced anything like this before. He started noticing a lingering chemical metallic taste and began to be concerned he was being poisoned. But who was poisoning him? His wife, dermatologist, Emily Yu. Jack stated that their marriage had also been abusive, not only to himself, but also to their two children. He accused Emily of depriving the children of sleep, screaming at them and calling them names. He set up a nanny cam in the home's kitchen, and soon after it was turned on, he witnessed something he never thought was possible. He caught his wife pouring Drano into a hot lemonade he drank every morning confirming his worst suspicions. He continued recording footage and got three separate instances of Emily pouring Drano into his cup. Jack brought the video footage to a lawyer who helped him draft up a divorce, as well as a protective order for himself and his children. 45-year-old Emily Yu was approached while she was leaving her place of employment and subsequently arrested on August 4th. While in custody, she was served with a protective order barring her and her mother from coming within 100 feet of Jack their children, their school, or the family home. She was also notified that Jack had sought emergency custody of their children, which was granted. She was held on a $30,000 bail, which she posted and was released. Her lawyer has released a statement saying, Ms. Emily, you vehemently and unequivocally denies ever attempting to poison her husband or anyone else. He said in a statement to media, as a well-respected physician, her goal has always been to help people and never to harm people. Accordingly, she also strongly denies her husband's claim of abuse over him and her children. Her legal team has gone on to say that Emily was pouring Drano into an empty cup next to the lemonade to prevent the chemical from splashing, and then she went on to use the cleaning product as intended on the drains in the kitchen. She denies ever putting Drano into Jack's drinks. In response to the video evidence, her lawyer stated, the video does not depict any wrongdoing on behalf of my client and does not depict her trying to poison her husband. That is all I can say now. 
Her legal team also stated that Jack fabricated the video evidence in order to get an upper hand in divorce and custody agreements. Law enforcement has said at this time they don't believe there's any reason for previous clients or patients of Ms. Yu to be worried, as they believe this is isolated to domestic violence. Her employer is said to be cooperating with law enforcement and have also stated that Ms. Yu is no longer working at the hospital. Jack's lawyer has stated that his client is feeling much better with the protective order, and his physical ailments are improving over time. Emily Yu has not been charged yet. Her next scheduled court date is November 3rd, 2022. Now I just want to say that this case is still developing. In early August, a New Zealand woman placed a bid for the contents of an unclaimed storage unit. The unit had been noted as containing household and personal items. This is a common practice for storage units that have gone unpaid for some time. The contents of the storage unit were successfully won, and the company, Safe Store Storage, delivered the items to their home on August 11, 2022. They started going through the contents. There were children's toys, a couple of strollers, and mostly normal household items. They were sorting through the items when they came across two matching suitcases. They opened them up and made a horrific discovery. The remains of two small children were inside the suitcases. Law enforcement was called and the home was shut down while New Zealand crime scene investigators secured the scene and the contents of the storage unit. The children have been identified and so far only their ages have been released as 5 and 10. Experts estimate that they have been deceased for 3 to 5 years. The storage unit owner has also been identified and is now living in South Korea. Prior to her moving from New Zealand, she did have two children with her and is believed she is the mother of the two found in the suitcases. South Korean law enforcement is working with New Zealand to locate her and get DNA confirmation. However, New Zealand law enforcement believes the children have relatives still in the country who may not have been aware of their deaths. In a statement to the media, the lead investigator said, the investigation team is working very hard to hold accountable the person or persons responsible for the deaths of these children. At this point in time, there is no cause of death, but it is believed to be homicide. On August 4th, 2022, three men were arrested, thwarting a planned heist to steal $1.3 million worth of seafood from Nat Uno, a seafood importer based in Fort Lauderdale. The three men had created an elaborate scheme posing as grocery store buyers. Nat Uno started receiving orders from a man named Brian Gomez, who claimed to be the buying manager for a grocery chain in late June. Brian placed five orders and each time the orders were picked up without any cause of concern. Once the grocery store was invoiced for the purchases, it was then discovered that there was no Brian Gomez who worked for the grocery store. The email address attached to Brian was fraudulent. Police were alerted to the fraud scheme and a sting operation was put in place to find those responsible. In early August, Brian placed another order this time it was the largest. Officers waited at the warehouse to see who picked up the order and sure enough, at 9.35 a.m. on August 4th, a refrigerated truck arrived to pick up the order. Law enforcement followed the truck, which was also being accompanied by a red Mustang, to a warehouse in Weston, Florida. In 15 minutes, three men were arrested. Rene Echevarria Akeman, 33, Ernesto Aguilera Burt, 36, and Jose Luis Batista Suarez, 40. At the time of their arrest, they had $300,000 worth of product, and they were also charged with the other deliveries, totaling $1.3 million. The 14 charges include grand theft cargo and obtaining property over $5,000. All three men have been identified as Miami locals, and their next court appearances are unknown at this time. On September 5, 1992 in Mountain View, California, person jogging noticed something odd. It was evening and the surrounding buildings were mostly owned by tech giants. The parking lot in the 1300 block of Crittendale Lane, which is now owned by Google, was mostly empty. Though it wasn't unusual to see cars still parked in the lot this late, someone appeared to be sleeping in one of them. The jogger approached and made the shocking realization that the person wasn't sleeping. Law enforcement arrived when the scene quickly identified the person in the car as 25-year-old Lori Holtz, and they quickly deemed her death as a homicide as she still had a nylon rope around her neck. 
Detectives determined that she had died in the car as there were signs of a struggle. Her purse was recovered nearby, thrown over a fence near the crime scene. What stood out to detectives was that it appeared that the killer had been in the passenger seat, where they might have expected the killer to have been in the back seat. This led to detectives to believe that whoever killed Lori had been someone she knew or was comfortable letting into her car. Numerous fingerprints were recovered from in and around the vehicle. Lori worked nearby and had been expected to attend a wedding later that evening. With the help of her boyfriend, they'd been able to piece together her day. Lori worked for Adobe and worked less than two miles from where she was found. She planned to pop into the office, it had been a Saturday, and she hadn't planned on staying long after going home, getting dressed up, and meeting her boyfriend Brent at the wedding. Lori was a computer engineer and she had landed the job at Adobe and was one of the few women working at the tech giant. She had been known to be an extremely hard worker, often going to work on the weekend and working late. She was incredibly talented and was a rising star in her field. This was right before the tech boom in Silicon Valley. Because she and her boyfriend were going to meet at the wedding, her absence wasn't initially a cause for concern. At first, he just assumed that she'd gotten wrapped up with something at work and Brent hoped she would turn up later, but she never did. Detectives were able to rule Brent out as a suspect, as he'd been miles away at the wedding where many people witnessed him. During his interview, he did allude to someone who may have been angry enough with Lori to kill her. He alleged that his roommate John Woodward had been increasingly aggressive towards Lori. They'd been dating for five weeks, and when he told his roommate that he had a serious girlfriend, he said that John started acting jealous. Brent was set up with a recording device and was asked by law enforcement to call John and get him to confess to murdering Lori. During that conversation, John didn't act surprised he was being investigated. There hadn't been a moment where he questioned why cops were looking at him. John didn't explicitly say that he killed Lori, but he did ask Brent what and how much evidence did the police have against him. Not exactly something an innocent person would say, but it wasn't enough. John was picked up for an interview and his prints were taken. He didn't have an alibi for that day. He claimed he was home alone and no one was able to corroborate that. While investigating Lori's car, they found over 80 fingerprints. Prints were found on the roof of the passenger side of the vehicle, as well as the handle and the inside of the door. The prints were a match for John Woodward. He was first arrested later that year and was charged with Lori's murder. His trial was in 1995, which resulted in a hung jury. There wasn't enough evidence. In the second trial in 1996, the judge didn't allow the prosecution to investigate Lori's bring forward the prints found inside the vehicle or any discussions that John had killed Lori out of jealousy, as there wasn't solid enough evidence to prove that. The second jury also came back with a hung verdict, and the case was ultimately dismissed. After that, Woodward moved to the Netherlands where he was the CEO of ReadyTech. Though the company remained based in California, its CEO headed their Amsterdam offices. After the second trial, the case ultimately went cold. No other suspects were discovered. There hadn't been any other evidence found that pointed to anyone else being in that vehicle. In 2020, the case was reopened with several pieces of evidence sent out for further examination. This time, they were looking for DNA. In 2021, they had the results that tied John Woodward directly to Lori's murder. DNA matching Woodward's was found on the rope that had strangled her. Woodward was still living in Amsterdam and the U.S. Department of Justice worked collaboratively with the Dutch government. Dutch authorities arrested Woodward and executed a search warrant for his home and office. On July 9, 2022, John Woodward is extradited back to the U.S., where he was arrested at the airport in New York. Woodward, now 58, is being held without bail while he waits extradition back to California, where his trial will be held. Lori's sister, in a brief statement to the media, extended her thanks to law enforcement for continuing to pursue her sister's murder and for ensuring there was justice. She said of her sister, Lori was someone we all aspired our daughters to be like, kind, loyal, and fun. The way Lori lived and treated people was a stunning example of what was right in the world. She was a gem to many, but her bright life was taken from us at the age of 25. This case is the culmination of incredible determination by our detectives over the decades 
and with phenomenal teamwork with our agency partners here in Santa Clara County and in New York, said Mountain View Police Chief in a press release issued by the department. It was on September 7, 1979 in Conroe, Texas, when 12-year-old Ligia Jackson was swimming at a lake with her two older brothers. The kids had walked to Lake Wildwood and lived nearby. Eventually, Ligia's brothers were ready to go home, but she wanted to stay longer. Her brothers started walking home, and they eventually saw her trailing behind and didn't think much of it. When the boys got home, they expected Ligia to walk through the front door shortly after they did. She hadn't been that far behind them when they last saw her, but she never did. They went back outside and didn't see her. They walked the route back and couldn't find any sign of their sister. Law enforcement was contacted shortly after and conducted a thorough investigation of the area, but again, nothing was found. The following day, the boys went back out to look for their sister. They felt responsible for her disappearance. What had been a silly argument between siblings had turned into something awful. That was when Ligia's tortoiseshell glasses were found in an intersection between the lake and their house, and they knew for certain that something bad had happened. Her parents filed an official missing persons report after the glasses were found, and the investigation focused on the belief that Ligia had been abducted. Six days later, oil field workers discovered a body in a heavily wooded area. They had gone in to check on a pipeline that cuts through Conroe. The body was confirmed to be that of Ligia Jackson. Her murder was ruled a homicide with her cause of death being strangulation. She had been sexually assaulted with her clothing recovered in the area. Tire trademarks were also preserved as evidence, but there was little other evidence for investigators to go on. It was noted that the day that she disappeared, Lacey had been wearing a gold butterfly necklace with a matching gold butterfly ring. The ring was never recovered, and detectives had hoped it had been taken by the killer and one day could be used as evidence. But that never panned out and the ring remained lost. For four decades, the case sat cold. Hundreds of leads came in over the years, and each one was investigated, but never led to any advances in the case. As the years went on, so did the hopes of ever solving the case. In 2021, the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Homicide Unit decided to reinvestigate Ligia Jackson's case. They sent off several items of evidence for advanced DNA testing. After 40 years, they had new DNA evidence. July 2022, the DNA matched with someone within Cody's, the National FBI database, Gerald Dwight Casey. Records show that Casey lived in Conroe at the time of Lizia's murder. It is unclear if there were additional victims connected to Casey. Casey had an extensive criminal history, which included violent robberies, assault, and drug-related offenses. He had been in and out of prison frequently between 1976 and 1989. He was arrested in 1989 for robbery and murder. In 1991, he was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death by lethal injection. Casey's sentence was carried out in 2002. Lacia's cold case has now been closed, making it the MCSO's oldest cold case to be solved. In a statement to the media, they said, the tenacity and diligence in solving this case by a dedicated team is a reminder to our public and to those who commit crimes in our communities that we will never cease our efforts to solve the hardest of cases and bring closure to traumatized families. This next, now solved cold case highlights how instrumental it is to keep these cold cases in the media. You truly never know who will see the coverage that may be instrumental in providing a piece of key information that will solve a case. On February 26, 1999, in a wooded area behind an old church cemetery in DeKalb County, Georgia, the body of a small child was discovered. The body had badly decomposed over the winter and was estimated to have been there for three to four months. The child was a boy, African-American, around four feet tall with a small frame, and his age was estimated between five and seven. He had been wearing a plaid and navy blue hoodie, red denim jeans, and Timberland boots. Law enforcement in the area worked hard to try and identify the child, but no one came forward. There also weren't any missing persons reports matching his description. An autopsy was done which showed he had high levels of diphenhydramine and acetaminophen from over-the-counter pain relievers and Benadryl in his system. Additionally, he had a significant head wound on his skull. 
Either the drug overdose or the injury could have been the cause of his death. When they couldn't identify him locally, they opted to do advanced testing on his teeth to see if there were any markers that would indicate he had been born and raised somewhere else. That examination came back to determine he was likely from the southeastern U.S., either Georgia or the Florida area. Medical examiners on his case started to call him Dennis to give the little boy something to be called other than the Clifton John Doe. It had been a case that spoke to many, with media across the U.S. featuring his case. Without identification, the case eventually went cold, but detectives were determined to find who this boy was and what happened to him. Several different reconstructions were done over the years, from a model figure to several reconstruction images. Annually, they would hold memorial events to keep his story in the media. It was one of these events in May 2020 that caught the eye of one woman. The woman had been looking for answers regarding a little boy she used to babysit who had disappeared decades earlier, seven-year-old William Deshaun Hamilton. She called the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children's tip line with a possible identification for the unidentified child. This tip was the first major lead in the case in over 20 years. An investigation began to find William Hamilton, who had lived in Charlotte, North Carolina in the late 90s. They traced his school records there, and when they investigated further, they learned that William's mother had abruptly pulled him out of the school year in December, 98, and told people she was moving to Atlanta. It was only months after that when the body of the little boy was discovered. There were no records of William Hamilton after he was pulled from school. No medical records, school registrations, activity on a social insurance number. He simply vanished. This led investigators to believe that Ava had been correct in her identification. The next step was to locate his mother, Teresa and Bailey Black, who had been the last person to have been with William, but tracking her down hadn't been easy. She had left Atlanta in late 98 and returned back to Charlotte, Georgia. It was then that William's absence was noticed, especially to Ava. Teresa gave conflicting accounts to anyone who asked about where William was, and she eventually left Georgia, disappearing for nearly a decade. She resurfaced in Alaska in 2010, then moved to Phoenix, Arizona, which was where she was located by law enforcement. She was arrested in June 2022 and required to submit DNA to compare to the remains of the little boy. And after 23 years, they could finally officially identify little John Doe as William Hamilton. Teresa Bailey Black, now 45 years old, was arrested and will be extradited back to Georgia, which will be charged with two counts of felony murder, two counts of child cruelty, aggravated assault and concealment of death. So far, it has not been released if she has cooperated with law enforcement or has provided details of what happened to William in 98. It has been reported that Bailey Black is not in good health. Her booking photos show she has a medical tube in. She also arrived in court in a wheelchair. She had also previously served prison in 94 for manslaughter and had a criminal history with several other nonviolent offenses. It was around 5 a.m. on August 10, 1992 when Donna Stagner went to wake up her 53-year-old husband John Stagner. The Stagner family lived in Orange County, Florida. John was a maintenance worker for the county, and the family lived in a home on the Orange County maintenance property and served as live-in caretakers for the equipment that was housed there. John had been called out the previous evening to repair a power line that had come down in a storm. When Donna had gone to bed, John had only just come home, and he was watching TV in the living room. The couple slept in separate bedrooms in the summer because Donna preferred to sleep with the air conditioning on and John didn't. She entered the bedroom John slept in and tried to wake him the following morning. She hadn't turned on the lights yet and touched his arm, only to notice he was cold to the touch. She turned on the lights and made the horrific discovery that her husband had been violently attacked. He'd been severely beaten to death. Donna called 911 and law enforcement came out to the property. Detectives secured the scene, DNA evidence while in its infancy in 1992, care was taken to find as much evidence as possible that may be useful, and it was preserved well. The murder weapon, a wood cane or walking stick was found at the scene, and it was determined that someone had come into the home while the family slept and attacked John while he slept. There was no evidence in the home to suggest there had been any struggles or break-ins. 
That night John had been sleeping with his bedroom window open. It was a single-story house and law enforcement believed the attacker entered the home that way. The crime was unusual. The home hadn't been burglarized, it didn't appear that anything was missing, and John had been the sole victim. John was a hard-working man, he had worked for Orange County for many years and was well-respected in his community. He was also very generous and treated those around him with kindness. His murder had not only been shocking, but senseless. Officers started canvassing everyone in John's life. Friends, family, and co-workers, trying to find someone who may have harbored a grudge towards John. One name came up, Ronald or Ronnie Cates. Cates was in his 30s, and his family was close to the Stagner family. The Stagners had really helped out Cates and his family, who at one point had been homeless, and John provided them with housing, money, and meals. Some even said that John had been a father figure to Cates. Needless to say, the Sagner family had always been kind and generous to the family. Detectives learned from Donna that John and Ronnie had a little bit of a falling out. John had lent Ronnie a bunch of tools and asked for them to be returned, and John was having a hard time getting them back from Ronnie, which had him frustrated. Law enforcement went to Kate's house to interview him, and when they got there, his young daughter answered the door and seemed visibly shaken. She said that he wasn't home. They stayed near the home for a bit and noticed later a truck peel out of the driveway. They went back to the home, and his daughter admitted that her father had been home and she had been instructed to lie to them. They wrote down a detailed account of the interaction, which had been helpful in the present-day investigation. They did eventually catch up with Cates and brought him in for questioning, and he gave several variations of his whereabouts the night that John had been murdered. Along with him evading police and other accounts from those who interacted closely with Cates, they were immediately suspicious that he may have been involved in John's murder. The best tools law enforcement had for prosecution in 92 were blood evidence and fingerprints, but because Cates had been a frequent guest, the prosecution didn't think it would be enough to prove that Cates had been in the home that night. Eventually, no additional information was found that could be used as evidence against him, and the case went cold. Then, in 1995, Ronald Cates was committed during a mental health crisis. While in hospital, Cates confessed to killing a man in 92, but also had confessed to killing several historical figures, and although it was noted, there wasn't much that could be done with that confession because he hadn't been in a mental state that could hold him accountable. Then, in 2020, Cates found himself in other criminal troubles and was put in jail. Once he was in jail, Cates' wife came forward with information that she had been too scared to come forward with before. She explained that Kate was a violent man, and he had abused substances for much of their marriage. Now that she felt it was safe to do so, she wanted to get justice for the Stagner family. She said that in 92 she had been the sole breadwinner for the family. She said that at the time her husband hadn't been able to keep a job because he'd been addicted to drugs. She also confirmed that Cates had sold several of John Stagner's tools that had been lent to him in order to purchase drugs. She believed that Cates had murdered John after he had confronted him about bringing the tools back. The murder weapon had never been released to the media, but had been some sort of homemade walking stick. She confirmed that Cates used to always walk around with one. She also revealed that he hadn't been home that night, but returned in the early morning hours on the night John was murdered, with his clothing covered in blood. When they interviewed Kate's children, one of them had a vivid memory of her father asking her to hide a bunch of clothing underneath the house. Then two days later, she was asked to grab the clothing again, and she watched him burn the clothing. In August 2022, Ronald Cates was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. He's being held in North Carolina jail while he awaits extradition back to Florida. Cates has been open and forthcoming with law enforcement. While he didn't explain the motive behind killing John, he did reveal how John was murdered and several details that only someone who had been there would have known. The Orange County Sheriff's Office thanked the Cates family for coming forward with the information that led to Ronald Cates' arrest. While it is uncommon, they are grateful that they did that. Without their testimony, the case may have never been closed. On October 26, 1970 in Sacramento, California, 28-year-old Nancy Benelak was late for work. It had been extremely unusual for her. She worked for the Sacramento County as a court reporter, and she never missed a court date. 
A coworker called her house and there wasn't an answer. So she called her son to ask him to swing by her apartment and check on her. He did, buzzing several times with no response. He then convinced the apartment manager to get access into the apartment. And after knocking several times without a response, they did. Inside, they discovered a brutal scene. There was blood everywhere. Nancy was found deceased in the home. Her autopsy determined she had been stabbed over 30 times. There was a massive investigation into Nancy's murder. Her fiancé at the time was Chief Public Defender Farah Salami, and initially, they weren't sure if it had been retaliation from a disgruntled client. The killer had appeared to have taken care not to leave evidence behind. They found a piece of tape that appeared to have been used by the killer to wrap his fingertips in an attempt to not leave any prints. However, the killer may have underestimated Nancy, as there appeared to have been a massive struggle. Nancy had several defensive wounds, and it appeared that at one point she had managed to get the knife from her attacker and fight back, because there was a significant amount of blood left behind from her killer. Salome had been with Nancy the night before, the two had gone for dinner, and he had dropped her off, stayed at her apartment for a bit before leaving around 11.30 at night to go back to his own apartment. He said it had been normal for Nancy to leave her balcony door open a bit so that her cat could go in and out of the apartment. She had never had any concerns about doing that since she lived on the second floor. Law enforcement believed that this is how the killer got in by scaling the balcony below. The blood trail from the killer led from the balcony all the way to the apartment's parking lot. In the 70s, all law enforcement could do with blood was get the killer's blood type, which had been useful in eliminating suspects, like Nancy's fiancé, but didn't lead to any suspects. They had interviewed over 500 potential suspects, but nothing brought the case to a close. Years later, the DNA profile was done and uploaded into state and national databases. For five decades, the case sat cold. Farah Salome died in 2014 of leukemia at the age of 84, never knowing what happened to his fiance. In 2019, the case was reopened by the Sacramento County Cold Case Team, and they decided genetic genealogy was going to be the best way to get an identification of Nancy's killer. Through that process, they identified several relatives related to the suspect, and in 2022, they finally had a confirmed identification after 52 years. Richard John Davis. He was a longtime Sacramento resident. He would have been 27 years old at the time of Nancy's murder, and he lived in the apartment building near Nancy Benelak. His apartment faced hers, and he would have had an unobstructed view into her apartment, and it is believed that he may have been stalking her. Davis didn't have any violent criminal history, but did have several DUIs. Davis died in 97 at the age of 54 from complications of alcoholism. Nancy's sister attended the press conference announcing Davis as the murderer. Retired Sacramento County Detective Mickey Lynx led the press conference. On October 23, 1988, the body of a young woman was found in a wooded area near Reading, Pennsylvania. Her death was immediately ruled a homicide. They determined she died by strangulation, and she still had bawling twine wrapped around her neck. Law enforcement concluded that the woman had been murdered in a secondary location before her body was dumped in the woods. They later were able to identify the woman as 26-year-old mother of three, Anna Kane. The local newspaper ran a cover story about the murder, seeking information from anyone who had seen Anna the night she died, or if anyone knew who she was with that night. Anna was a sex worker, and law enforcement were having a difficult time getting people to talk to police. Detectives didn't have a lot of evidence to go on, but they did discover that her killer had left DNA on her clothing, as well as a twine used to strangle her. Then, in 1990, a letter came into the newspaper that ran that story of Anna's death. Addressed from a concerned citizen, the writer had included several details that had never been released to the media information only the killer would have known. Detectives believed that the killer had penned the letter to taunt law enforcement. They kept the letter and years later, they were able to collect DNA from the envelope and match it to the DNA found on Anna's clothing. In 2002, the Pennsylvania State Police received a grant, which would give them funding to do genetic genealogy testing, and later that year they had a suspect, Scott Grimm. Once Grimm was identified, law enforcement looked to confirm the DNA connection. 
Grimm had died in 2018 at the age of 58. However, he'd been involved in a harassment case with an ex-business partner where he had mailed several menacing letters. They compared the DNA from those envelopes to the DNA in Anna's case, and it was a direct match. At this time, law enforcement are continuing to investigate how Grimm connected with Anna, and if there are more victims out there. Anna's daughter Tamika Reyes was nine when her mother was taken away from her. Despite the struggles her mother faced, she wants her to be remembered as much more than what the media has portrayed her to be. Anna Kane was a loving mother. She was outgoing, fearless, and caring. She cherishes the memory she has of her mother and remembers her as a woman who made great sacrifices for her children and was loved by all those who knew her. The Miramichi on the coast of New Brunswick is renowned for its earnest beauty and lush greenery. And as soon as the first rays of sunlight glint brightly on the clear waters of the Miramichi River, the streets would buzz with life and joy as the residents began their daily routine. It was a peaceful community where people normally didn't lock their doors. They left their cars unlocked and slept without worry. Until one day it wasn't. In the late 1980s, the sense of security became a thing of the past when a reign of terror began after a series of heinous crimes committed by a man without mercy. A man who loathed society and believed it was responsible for how his life turned out. On June 21, 1986, in the early morning hours, a frantic 911 call came to dispatchers. The victim, Mary Glenn Denning, had been beaten severely and discovered her husband had been murdered. They owned a convenience store, which was attached to their home and she detailed that she and her husband had heard a break-in, and when they confronted the robbers, they were viciously attacked. She had lost consciousness, and her attacker likely thought she was dead. While talking to the 911 operator, she identified her attacker, Miramichi local and regular customer, Alan Legere, and two younger men. With Mary's description and the evidence left behind, the police had no trouble finding the perpetrators. The three were arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Alan Joseph Ledger was born on February 13, 1948 to a low-income family living in Chatham Head, a neighborhood of the Miramichi. Not only did Ledger grow up in poverty, but he was surrounded by a significant amount of crime. The area was known for thefts, assaults, and break-ins, and it was the kind of environment where he discovered his own taste for criminal acts. He'd walked out on his family, leaving behind three small children and a single mother to fend for them. Alan had a rough upbringing, his family had always struggled with financial difficulties, and other children made fun of him and his siblings for being fatherless. That made Alan feel like an outcast. He leaned heavily on his older brother, who he looked up to. Alan was also seen as a Jacqueline Hyde type character even as a child. To those he was fond of, he was seen as a sweet, charming, and lovely child. Those he disliked described him as a spiteful, cruel little boy. This would go on to follow him into adulthood, where to one person he was charming and incredibly friendly, and to the next he would be loathsome and frightening. He would often talk to his mother about resenting the local community for turning its back on them. His mother tried many times to talk him out of these negative thoughts, but her attempts were always futile, and it was the beginning of Alan's cycle of hatred and disdain towards society. Alan plagued his community from a young age. He would break into homes, sometimes just to see if he could do it, and sometimes he would steal things, food, jewelry, and money. He had been well known by law enforcement and had been in and out of jail throughout his youth. He was known in the community as being unpredictably violent. The Legere family would change forever when Alan's older brother would be hit by a truck while crossing a bridge. Alan's mother, enraged with grief, turned that anger towards Alan frequently telling him that the wrong son had been killed and it should have been him. This would be a final straw for Alan. He'd lost his brother, his confidant, and his only friend, and he felt his mother had betrayed him with her vitriol. His community feared him because of his violent nature and petty crimes, and he felt he wasn't wanted by anyone. Alan decided to leave Chatham when he was 16. He moved a thousand kilometers away to Winchester, Ontario, a town located about an hour south of Ottawa. He felt it was a fresh start and an opportunity to reinvent himself. He started working as a car salesman, his only ever legitimate job, 
but it wouldn't take long for him to realize that going to work every day wasn't as lucrative as petty crime. He also struggled in the sales environment. He started looking for other ways to earn easy money and eventually resorted to a life of crime. Petty theft becoming his way of rebelling against the society that had shunned him. He went back to breaking into homes and stealing cash and valuables. Sometimes he would get caught in the act, resulting in him getting beaten and ridiculed, something that further fueled his animosity towards the community. It's also where he learned to target only those who were more vulnerable, seniors, people with disabilities, and those who were less likely to fight back. While he was living in Ontario, he met a woman and got married. The couple had two children together, but Alan was discovered to have several affairs, and the two would soon divorce after a few years. By his mid-thirties, Alan was tired of trying to fit in. He was working a job he aided, and his co-workers were making fun of him. So shortly after turning 37, he quit his job and moved to an area in the Miramichi Valley called the Black River Bridge. It was there that he met John and married Glenn Denning, were a lovely couple who owned a small shop and lived above it. The locals loved them. They'd open the shop early in the morning to meet and chat with their customers. One of them was Alan Ledger. In the years in his absence, his reputation as a youth had dissipated somewhat. People had been willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, hoping to believe that he had outgrown his Alan, had taken a special interest in the Glendennings upon seeing the safe in their shop. He also learned from John that they weren't keeping their savings in a bank. He started to plan a robbery. He thought it was going to be a pretty straightforward job. He'd seen the safe, he knew where it was, and John was a 66-year-old man who didn't stand a chance against Alan, who was nearly six feet tall. But Alan's plan included one tricky part. He wanted to steal the entire safe and take it to a hiding place. So he spent some time looking for accomplices to help him break into the shop and carry the safe. He found his match in 18-year-old Todd Machette and 19-year-old Scott Curtis, who had a long history of petty theft despite their young age. On the night of June 21, 1986, the trio decided to put their seemingly perfect plan into motion. They broke into the shop, found the fuse box, and cut the power. Until then, the plan was going smoothly, but when they reached the place where the safe was supposed to be kept, they were shocked to find it was gone. They decided to search for it upstairs, but found themselves face to face with John and Mary, who, unfortunately for them, were still awake. They ambushed John and beat him furiously until he was all bloodied and battered. They did the same to Mary, and she'd also been sexually assaulted. Then the three decided to flee the scene after realizing the mess they made, leaving the Glendonans for dead. They hadn't anticipated anyone finding the bodies until morning. And they certainly had no idea that Mary had survived the attack. After the three were arrested, they were held while they were waiting trial. During the trial, Alan claimed that even though he was present at the scene, he never participated in the assault, but of course he didn't fool the jury and was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 18 years. Alan thought he didn't deserve to be in prison, which made the hatred he already harbored for the community reach new heights. He filed two unsuccessful appeals before realizing he wouldn't be able to secure freedom legally. While in prison, he'd become a model prisoner. Shockingly, he didn't get into any trouble there. He worked out, read books, got along with other inmates, and did his work pleasantly. He built up a friendly relationship with prison workers. What they didn't realize was Legere was playing long con and was working on his prison escape. On May 3, 1989, Allen was escorted to the Dr. George L. Dumont University Hospital in Moncton, Ontario to be treated for a bad ear infection. At the time, no one knew that Allen had devised a plan to make his infection so bad it was impossible to be treated at the prison infirmary. He would poke his ear with metal objects and even pour his own urine into it to make the infection worse. Once in the hospital, Allen asked the prison guards to allow him to use the washroom. The guards didn't see it as an issue, and he was still shackled at the hands and feet so they didn't think much of it. They let him go into the washroom, unsupervised. Ledger took the opportunity to put a well-thought-out plan into action. Alan fashioned a piece of metal into a handcuff key and had hidden it on his person. He also had a metal antenna from his prison-issued TV set, which was concealed within his body. 
Alan asked the guards by the door for toilet paper to buy himself enough time to unlock the handcuffs and shackles. Then he used the antenna, which he fashioned into a shiv, to threaten the guards before making a run for it. The guards didn't have any weapons on them. They only had pepper spray, which hadn't done much as they chased Leger through the hospital. Leger had prepared for this physically, and he'd been able to easily outpace the guards. Outside the hospital, Peggy Olive was just exiting her car when she was viciously put back into it by none other than Alan Leger, who hijacked the car and kidnapped her. He ordered her to drive, and the terrified Peggy drove him to where he wanted to go. Eventually, he allowed her to pull over and get out of the car. He then assured her that he wouldn't harm her car, thanked her, and then took off. He dumped the vehicle outside of Moncton. After his escape, Alan Leger wasted no time getting back into committing crimes. On May 7th, he was suspected of attacking a man named Max Ramsey, who was found beaten after his car and wallet were stolen. The car was later found in a neighboring town. On May 10th, a woman's house was broken into and she found that all her jewelry was gone. A contingency plan was put into motion by the police, and helicopters were surveying the area from above. The manhunt was on, but Alan Lashar was nowhere to be found, and the last place they thought to look for Alan was back at the Marimiki. On May 29th, less than four weeks after his escape, Alan Lashar broke into a small convenience store owned by Annie Flam and her sister-in-law Nina. Both women were in their 80s. He first found Annie alone and demanded money from her. Then he tied her up and beat her repeatedly with a blunt object right in the face, breaking her jaw. He then sexually assaulted her before ending her life with one last blow to the head. By then, Nina had woken up and went to check up on her sister, losing her beat and sexually assaulted her too, until she faked losing consciousness, making him assume she was dead. He carried her to her room and tucked her into bed. Then he set the house on fire and stood outside, watching as the angry fires consumed the house. When Nina noticed the house was on fire, she ran to the door and she was pushed back into the house by Alan, who was still waiting outside. Patrolling officers were passing by the house when they saw the blazing flames and called the fire department. When the firefighters and paramedics arrived at the scene, they found the lifeless body of Annie Flam and the unconscious Nina Flam. They pulled Nina out in time, but she had second-degree burns on 70% of her body and had to be kept on a respirator. When they were able to question her, she told them that her attacker had a chain around his waist and was rambling about how society had failed him. For the police, a chain around his waist meant one thing. The culprit had to be an escaped prisoner. However, at the time, there were two more fugitives other than Alan Legere that had escaped. Brothers David and John Tenischuk escaped from prison on May 22nd, but the police shortly found them in a hunting camp. They were eliminated as suspects, leaving Alan Legere as the prime suspect. RCMP officer Kevin Mall was called into the case. He took a semen sample from the surviving victim and wanted to prove that it belonged to Legere. However, DNA analysis was still a new science and had only been used in the US and Britain. On June 1st, Joe Irving chased an intruder who tried to break into his house through multiple yards before losing him. The following day, a Chatham contractor found a pair of glasses very close to where Irving had lost track of the intruder. Officer Kevin Mole took the glasses to an optometrist, who confirmed that they were in the same style, size, and prescription Luja was wearing when he escaped prison. On September 30th, a man was shot in the back by a shotgun. And on the following day, a couple were beaten in their home. It was believed that Legere committed these crimes because they took place near a police station and they thought that Legere was the only one bold enough to attack people so close to law enforcement. However, at that time, Alain Legere wasn't the only one stirring the pot around the Miramichi region. Allard V. New of Newcastle was arrested and charged with those two attacks. Law enforcement now had the issue of copycat killers. Back now around October, the Supreme Court of Canada shut down another appeal attempt from Alain Leger, saying they couldn't provide a ruling while the accused was unlawfully at large. Ironically, Leger thought he stood a chance of winning the appeal while he was on the run. This proves how delusional and self-entitled Leger was. A psychologist at the Atlantic Institution referred to him as a classic psychopath. 
He had no remorse and thought he shouldn't be incriminated or imprisoned for anything he did. According to a ledger, it was the community who should be blamed. On Friday the 13th of October, ledger struck again. Both in their 50s, sisters Donna and Linda Donnie were murdered in their home, which was later set on fire. Ledger unscrewed the light bulbs, disconnected the telephone lines, and picked the lock on the back door. Then he tied up Linda, made her watch, as he sexually assaulted and tortured her sister. The autopsy results showed that Donna had been tortured and beat on the head until she died. Afterwards, the same fate befell Linda. When the police found the two bodies, they had a hard time telling them apart because of how badly and beaten and burned they were. They ended up identifying them through their size. The crime scene was identical to the first one, and law enforcement immediately suspected Alan Legere, and they realized Legere's M.O. and signature were leaving behind a trail of destruction and mayhem. By then, the Miramichi was in total panic. People stopped going out, traffic diminished, and those that left their doors unlocked for years began installing security systems and lights in their home to deter Legere from choosing them as a target. As a result, this whole system was given the name the Legere Lights. That year Halloween was also canceled, as the last thing police wanted were people roaming the streets in masks, making it a golden opportunity for Legere to mingle and strike again. Ledger knew the Miramichi area well, making the police feel like they were chasing a ghost lurking in the shadows. Lead detective commented saying that he was able to slip under the radar and commit another crime and us not able to stop that, it was a tremendous feeling of helplessness. On November 14th, Roman Catholic priest James Smith left the Miramichi Hospital at 5 p.m. and went back to the rectory where he lived. At 9 p.m., a neighbor saw him standing on his patio looking around as if he'd heard something. This was the last time anyone had seen him alive. The following day, the priest was supposed to hold service. But when he failed to show up, people grew concerned as they knew the father to always be punctual. So they decided to check his house and nothing would have ever prepared them for what they found inside. Even the police officers described the crime scene as a scene from hell. Blood was everywhere. Father Smith had a massive cut on his chest. His eyes were gouged out. Three of his teeth were broken and someone had tried to rip out his tongue. And the autopsy report revealed that his rib cage had been separated from his sternum meaning that whoever killed him had stood up on his chest with both feet and jumped up and down forcefully. They even discovered that the killer had the audacity to spend the night at the father's house after committing his heinous crime. He ate, washed his boots, put plastic bags on his feet to keep them dry, and changed his bloody clothes, and even answered the phone, telling the caller they'd gotten the wrong number. A further inspection of the crime scene led them to discover lots of DNA and hair samples that they were able to later confirm belonged to Alan Ledger. They also found bloody footprints that led them to the garage, where they discovered that Father Smith's car had been stolen. Finally, they tracked the car to a train station, where a cashier told them that the man matching Legere's description had purchased a ticket to Montreal. The police immediately contacted the Quebec authorities and told them to stop the train and search the passengers. They gave them Legere's mugshot and told them to check for a tattoo of an eagle on the right forearm. One passenger slightly resembled the description, yet he appeared much smaller and was clean-shaven with short hair. On the other hand, Legere looked disheveled and rugged in the mugshot. The passenger told him his name was Fernand Serwa. They asked him to roll up his sleeve, and there was no tattoo so they let him go. However, that man was in fact Ledger, who had lost a lot of weight as a result of being on the run, and the description given to the police had an error. The eagle tattoo was actually on his left arm. Ledger had slipped through their fingers again, and the manhunt expanded countrywide. At this time, Crime Stoppers put an award for $50,000 for information leading to his arrest. On November 23rd, a St. John taxi driver was stopped by a man wanting to go to Moncton. The driver called the dispatcher and agreed to the ride when he found out the fare was $100. But once the man was inside the taxi, he revealed a gun and said, I'm the one they're looking for. I'm Alan Ledger. It was a snowy night, and the icy roads led the cab driver to lose control of the car and crashed into a snowbank. Alan ordered the driver out of the car and took him hostage. Then he hid the gun and managed to stop a car driven by a woman and asked her to help them. Being a good Samaritan, 
the woman agreed to give them a ride, and once they entered the vehicle, Legere showed his gun and revealed his identity to her. Little did he know, she was actually an off-duty RCMP officer. She drove for a while towards Moncton, but had to stop for gas. Ledger took the car keys, filled the tank, and walked into the store to pay the $15 for the gas. At the same time, Officer Michelle Mercer used the spare key she was hiding and drove away before Ledger could catch up to them. And in the early hours of November 24th, she walked into the nearest RCMP department and reported everything that had happened. They wasted no time setting up roadblocks and sent officers to the streets. Ledger told the trucker to use the back road, thinking that by doing this he was going to avoid the police. However, that alerted another trucker, who knew that large trucks couldn't use those back roads, and he notified police, and they managed to catch up with the truck after a 30-minute chase. Some law enforcement had expected a gun show, but once cornered, Alan Ledger tossed the gun out of the window, raised his arms, and surrendered without any resistance. Al Ledger wanted to be perceived as a strong, powerful, and competent man, but he could only display his violence and aggression towards people weaker than him, and he wasn't willing to fight several armed officers. On August 13, 1990, Ledger was sentenced to nine years for his escape and the kidnapping of Peggy Olive. They were to be served concurrently with the original life sentence he received for the Glendening murder, where DNA evidence was admitted to the courts for the first time in Canadian history. A year later, on November 3, 1991, Alan Legere was found guilty of all murder charges and was sentenced to life imprisonment without the eligibility for parole for 25 years. In 2020, he made a request for day parole, and in 2021, during his parole hearing, he said he couldn't fathom why the community refused to forgive him. He also said that he didn't see himself as a violent person. Needless to say, his parole was denied. Today, Alan Legere is 74 years old and living behind bars of a maximum security prison in Edmonton, Alberta. He has little to no hope of ever seeing the outside of its walls. On October 5, 1980, in Henderson, Nevada, the body of a young woman was found in a remote desert area. The young woman is estimated to be between the ages of 17 and 19. She had been found without any clothing, a purse, or identification. She was 5 feet 2 inches, 102 pounds, with light brown hair and blue eyes. Sketches were done of the unknown Jane Doe and circulated around the state, but no one came forward to identify her. Eventually, the Henderson Police Department gave her the moniker Jane Herrero Grandot for the area she was found in. Fingerprint and dental characteristics were logged with national databases. A description included references to a crude, apparently amateur S tattoo made with blue ink on the inside of her right forearm. She had pierced ears, a vaccination scar on her left bicep, and had dental work done in the past. She had died from blunt force trauma, and her death was ruled as a homicide. According to local police, she had been stabbed and beaten to death, possibly with a hammer. She had facial injuries, multiple head wounds, and puncture or stab wounds on her back. One of her teeth had even been knocked out. She'd been in the desert for less than 24 hours before her body was discovered. Despite best efforts from law enforcement, they weren't able to locate anyone that recognized the Jane Doe and really had no way of solving her murder. The lead detective on her case, who had been with her since her discovery, had vowed to see her case through. He and his wife had even covered the cost of her burial. Her case quickly went cold and eventually was closed altogether. In 2015, detectives at the Henderson PD were going through unsolved cold cases and decided to give the Aurora Grande Jane Doe case another look. They reached out to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who had experts make an artistic rendering and began to circulate the image. They also exhumed her grave in order to get a fresh DNA sample. The case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries in 2021. In that same year, they received their first advance in the case in 40 years. Jane Doe's DNA had a direct familial match. They reached out to that person who ended up being Jane Doe's sibling. And after four decades, they had an identification. Tammy Terrell Tammy Terrell disappeared from Roswell, New Mexico, back in 1980. She was a troubled teen living in Roswell in a foster home with her four sisters. 
Despite the rough start she'd had in life, she was trying to turn her life around. On the night of her disappearance, her foster parents had dropped her off at the Eastern New Mexico fairgrounds in Roswell with another girl. When they returned to pick her up, Tammy was not there. According to authorities, she was last seen at a restaurant near the fairgrounds with a man and a woman. Tammy's sisters never stopped looking for her, and the lead detective that had originally worked her case was at the press conference when her identification was announced. Police agencies in Nevada and Southeast New Mexico are working together to find out who killed Tammy and how she ended up in Nevada. Roswell police are actively seeking leads for anyone who might have seen Tammy on the night in 1980 or knows anything about her disappearance. Anyone with information on the Tammy Terrell case is asked to contact Henderson Police Department or Crime Stoppers. On May 21, 2002, near Highway 135, just outside of Liberty, Texas, archaeologists collecting soil samples made a grisly discovery. They found a human skull and a partial skeleton remains in an open field near Swamp City Road. The medical examiner determined their remains belonged to a Hispanic or white woman between the ages of 16 and 30 and determined that the remains had been there for at least two years. Because the remains had been exposed to the elements for so long, it was difficult to determine the cause of death. There was no additional evidence found near the remains and nothing to identify the woman, and the case went cold before it could even begin. The case was re-examined in 2013, where the skull was scanned for 3D reconstruction. It was then that they discovered the victim had a cleft palate. They sent out the rending to various government agencies and attempted to match it to a missing persons case in Texas. They sent out the rendering to various government agencies and attempted to match it to a missing persons cases in Texas, but nothing came up. In 2019, the DNA Doe Project was contacted to help determine who the remains belonged to using genetic genealogy research. After two years, they traced her direct maternal line back to a family located in Virginia and North Carolina. They also discovered that the family had a daughter who had moved to Texas and had a cleft. Pallet. Law enforcement had never been able to locate that woman, who would have been 27 back in the late 90s, and there weren't any records of her after 1998, making officers confident that the remains belonged to Pamela Darlene Young. Pamela had never been reported missing by her family. She had relocated to Texas after falling out with family members. Chief Deputy Craig Harrington with the Greggs County Sheriff's Department said, There are no leads in this case. They are still hoping to find information about what happened to Pamela. They still have no idea how Pamela came to be in an open field and no cause of death was ever determined. But they did reveal they have a person of interest. However, they have been deceased since 2017. Anyone with information about Pamela, particularly if anyone knew her when she lived in Texas, is asked to call the Sheriff's Criminal Investigation Division or the Greggs County. On April 8, 1981, a young woman's body was found near the Pima County Fairgrounds in Arizona by a group riding off-road vehicles. Her body had been dumped along a dirt road. Detectives said it appeared that the woman had been sexually assaulted and suffered a violent death. She had been in the desert for a couple of days before she was discovered. No identification could be found for the young woman. She was described as blonde with delicate facial features. 18 to 20 years old, 5 foot 3 and a small frame. She was wearing a navy blue blouse with red sleeves and a floral print, blue jeans, white ankle socks with pom-poms, and brown suede shoes. Two jackets were also found near her body, one a blue denim with red and white stripes on the cuffs and collar, and the other a blue rain jacket. They did a sketch of the woman but no one came forward and she was given the name Pima for three decades. That was all she was known as. In 2012, detectives decided to reopen her investigation and gather new evidence. Her body was exhumed, DNA evidence was taken, and investigators also took the opportunity to create a 3D rendering of her skull to get a better idea of what she may have looked like. In 2014, it was determined that the reconstruction closely matched a potential unknown victim from an inmate in Arizona. John Kalhauser, who was serving 26 years and had taken a no-contest plea regarding his wife's disappearance. The photograph had been in his wallet when he was arrested, and he would never reveal who the young woman was. 
law enforcement paired the photograph with the reconstruction and sent it through social media all over the country, hoping someone would recognize her. Eventually, cold case detectives got in contact with Bill Giraud, who thought the reconstruction might be his sister. He wanted to get ruled out, still hoping his beloved sister was still alive. 20-year-old Brenda Giraud had been missing since 1981. She had left on a road trip with her boyfriend, John Kalhauser. Bill and Brenda had grown up in foster care, and they were all each other had for a family. Brenda was a few years older than he was, and he remembered how mad he was when Brenda told him she was going to California. He didn't want to be left behind, but Brenda assured him she wasn't going to abandon him. The two had kept in contact for the first few weeks after she left. She called him first from New Mexico, and she sent him an envelope of turquoise. Her last call had been from Arizona, where she had seemed upset, and told Bill that she was coming home. When he asked what was wrong, she didn't say. It had been a short call, but she told him that she loved him before hanging up. That was the last time Bill spoke to his sister. The envelope of turquoise she had mailed him arrived several weeks later. Over the years, Bill had made several attempts to find his sister, when law enforcement didn't file a police report believing she wasn't a missing person. Another attempt informed him that they had made contact with Brenda, and that she didn't want to be in contact with him, which had crushed him. To now know that after all these years she had been deceased was heartbreaking, but Brenda hadn't willingly left him behind. DNA confirmed Pima County Jane Doe was Brenda, and law enforcement brought that to John Kalhauser, who refused to acknowledge he knew Brenda. Bill said that he didn't know that John Kalhauser was a convicted murderer, and he thought Brenda didn't know either. He served seven years in prison for killing a man when he was only 17. He had also shot the lover of his fiancée in 1979. That man had survived three gunshot wounds and Kalhauser had been charged with armed assault with intent to murder. He was out on bond when he met Brenda. The two had met in a bar that Brenda was working at. Eventually he convinced her to take a trip with him to California, but what he didn't tell her was that he was skipping out on his parole. Bill remembered his final goodbye with Brenda. She had jumped on the back of Kalhauser's motorcycle and the two set off. John Kalhauser stayed in Arizona. He started going by the name Donald Stetchy, which had been the name of a classmate he'd gone to school with in elementary school. He got married to Diane Van Reeth, and the couple had two children together. In 95, Diane filed for divorce and sole custody of the children. On August 10, 1995, Diane left home from work and was never seen again. And it was then discovered that he was going by an assumed name. When law enforcement connected him to his real name, they found the warrant in Massachusetts for his arrest. He was extradited back to Massachusetts to serve 29 years for the assault of his former fiancé's boyfriend. He was also charged with Diane's murder in 99. Her body was never found. Kalhauser is scheduled for release in 2025. Anyone with information is asked to reach out to the Gregg County Crime Stoppers. 4. Kimberly Rana Jones on September 28, 2016. A new girl's body was found in a ravine near the White Hills area of Arizona, near Highway 93 and Dolan Springs, close to the Nevada border. Due to the body decomposition, an identification or cause of death could not be made at that time. Authorities shared a composite sketch on social media, but nobody responded. She was described as 5 feet 5 inches, with a slight frame, black hair that was born in a natural curly style. Her eye color was dark, and they estimated, based on her bone structure, that she was African American, biracial, or Hispanic. In 2020, the case was re-examined and the body was exhumed for new DNA samples. By July 2021, they had matched from a relative that had submitted their DNA with a missing person report in California. Mojave Jane Doe was identified as missing teen Kimberly Raina Jones. Kimberly Raina Jones was 18 at the time of her disappearance and was reported missing from San Bernardino, California. The investigation into Kimberly's disappearance and murder is ongoing. It was September of 1973 in Neath, Wales, a quaint community eight miles outside of the city of Swansea, when the bodies of two 16-year-old girls, Geraldine Hughes and Pauline Floyd, were found in the early morning hours dumped in a wooded area near their homes. 
The girls had been hitchhiking from a nightclub in the city of Swansea around 1.30 a.m. on September 1st, but the girls never made it home that night. The girls had been picked up and despite what should have been a short drive home, the girls were driven to a grove of trees near where they lived. There, Geraldine and Pauline were both sexually assaulted, then apparently allowed to redress as indicated by dirt and debris on the soles of their feet and inside their tights. They were both killed within yards of each other, sustaining head wounds and strangulation marks. It was determined that strangulation by rope was the cause of their deaths. How their killer managed to control and murder both girls simultaneously is unknown and likely never will be. The homicides left two families grief-stricken and the local community afraid and outraged. To make matters worse, this was not the only recent murder of a local teenage girl. Just a few months earlier, in July of 1973, 16-year-old Sandra Newton had been found dead in Neath, her body dumped in a culvert near the mountain roadway. Like Geraldine and Pauline, Sandra had been hitchhiking home from a nearby nightclub when she was picked up, sexually assaulted, and strangled to death with the hem of her chiffon skirt. Since all of the girls had been hitchhiking when they were picked up and killed, it's easy to look at a case like this from a modern perspective and wonder why such young girls would have been getting in a car with a strange man alone at night, but in the 1970s hitchhiking was normal. It was part of the culture, even for young women. There also often wasn't another option. When the girls were going out, there weren't any buses running at 1 or 2 a.m., and none of the victims had cars of their own. Taxis also would have been much too expensive, so this really only left hitchhiking when going out miles from home. With the hitchhiking, the assaults, and the strangulation in common, the connection between the murders seemed obvious to local citizens, news outlets, and police at first, but became complicated by the fact that Sandra had a married boyfriend who she'd been out with the night of her murder, who seemed a likely suspect in her murder investigation. Her boyfriend claimed they'd walked home in opposite directions, and that was the last he saw of her on the night of her death. And since her body was found miles away from where they had last been together, he was eventually ruled out as a suspect. So an alleged connection between the murders was established once again. Following the murders of Geraldine and Pauline in September, the Welsh police quickly assembled a huge team to catch the man that local papers began to call the Saturday Night Strangler. Over 150 detectives were dispatched to go door to door to see if anyone saw anything suspicious on the night of the murders. This case was about to become the largest murder inquiry in Welsh history. In 1973, when the investigation was just beginning, the term serial killer had not yet been coined. Little was known about this type of repeat killer. The personality or motivations of serial killers were not understood and criminal profiling and psychology were fairly new concepts. It would take another 10 years before DNA evidence would first be used in a criminal trial. Therefore, the police understandably had little to go on with the exception of one lead, a white car. Passing drivers had reported seeing this vehicle parked near Pauline and Geraldine's murder site between 1.45 to 2.15 a.m. on September 16th. Similarly, Others had reported a similar same color make and model of the car going like the clappers or very fast, in Neath at the time of Sandra's murder. They narrowed down the make and model based on witness statements to likely be a white Austin 1100, which at the time was an incredibly common vehicle. It had been Britain's best-selling car for almost a decade with over a million vehicles sold in the UK. The police felt confident that their killer would own or at least have been using that car. So they went right down the list of registrations, questioning anyone in the area who owned a white Austin 1100 car. The result was thousands of names that led to hundreds of interviews and an overwhelming amount of suspects and information. Police simply checked each Austin 1100 owner for an alibi and crossed each name off a list. There were so many people to comb through that the killer could have easily avoided suspicion and slipped through the cracks. And slipped through, he did. After several years without new information, the case went cold. It would be nearly three decades before new information gave the case any real traction and warranted its reopening. In the meantime, the families and communities were left without answers. In 2001, forensic science had really advanced to a point that the girls' clothing could be tested for DNA evidence. The girls' clothing was removed from an evidence box that had spent decades in sterile storage. Full DNA profiles were able to be pulled from the clothing articles that had been worn by Pauline and Sandra. 
samples from the two cases could be tested against one another, hopefully proving that the murders were committed by the same person. DNA taken from the two separate crime scenes were exact matches, finally showing that these three deaths had been the work of a single serial killer. This new evidence was compelling enough to reopen the case. Detectives began scouring the national databases for a match using the new DNA evidence. While they weren't able to find an exact match, they did find a near match which likely belonged to a relative of the killer. The similar DNA was that of Paul Kappen, a local car thief, which led back to a man who had been questioned for owning a white Austin 1100 as part of the initial investigation in 1973. His name was Joseph Kappen and he was now suspect number one. Joseph Kappen was a local to the Neath area. He had been born in Port Talbot in 1941. Those who knew Kappen described him as a man of violent disposition. As early as the age of 12, Kappen had come to the attention of the police. By the time the murders were committed, he had a record of more than 30 criminal offenses, including robbing gas meters, car theft, burglary, and assault. He was frequently in and out of prison, and he had never been able to hold down a job for long, but worked as a bus driver and a bouncer at local clubs on and off, giving Kappen the unique opportunity to commit the murders. He could have followed the teens right from the club. Kappen's ex-wife Christine is partially to blame for why he was overlooked. She provided his alibi on the nights of the murder. Joseph and Christine Kappen had met when he was 20, and she was 17. They married quickly after Christine discovered she was pregnant with their first child. Their 18-year marriage got off to a rough start when Joseph Kappen was sent to prison for three years for breaking into houses and robbing gas meters 10 days into their married life. But even when he got out of prison and became a father of two, it was never a happy household. Money was always tight since Kappen couldn't hold down a job, and they barely made ends meet with his short-lived gigs. In an interview, Christine said, I thought all men were violent. He used to sexual assault me every two weeks. It was against my will. I never wanted it. Joe would say, come on, come on. And then he would insist on his conjugal rights. In one incident, Kappen terrified his son Paul when he was just a child. While they were walking a beach, they found a dog. Kappen decided it was too old and proceeded to pick up a wire and strangle the dog in front of his son. This was also around the same time that the murders were being committed. When the police came knocking in 1973 to inquire about the murders, Christine had not put two and two together. She was young and naive and did not believe her husband was capable of murder. Furthermore, because Kappen was always committing petty crimes, Christine had learned to agree with him if the police showed up at the house. So like she often had, she alibied him for the night of the murders and the police checked him off their list. Three years went by before the DNA evidence had landed Kappen back on the police radar and made him their top suspect in 2002. Yet another obstacle stood in the way of the killer being brought to justice. Kappen had died of lung cancer at only 48 years old in 1990. Though Kappen could never be punished for ending the lives of the three young women, the police hoped they could still find a way to prove his guilt and bring a sense of finality and peace to the families of the victims. In 2003, police found a way to do just that when they received permission to exhume Kappen's body, extract a sample of his DNA, and test it against the samples found on the girls. When they did so, they received the answer they had been looking for and finally proved that Joseph Kappen was the man who sexually assaulted and killed Sandra Newton. Geraldine Hughes and Pauline Floyd in July and September of 1973. Kappen was the first person to be identified after death as a serial killer through familial DNA profiling. The conclusion of this case was not only a milestone in DNA profiling, but it brought answers to the three families of the girls who had never thought they would live to see their daughter's killer identified. We have relived what Geraldine must have gone through every night for nearly 30 years. Now we know for certain who killed our daughter, and we can finally find some peace. We took flowers to Geraldine's grave and had a few quiet words with her, and we felt we had put her to rest properly. In addition to the murders in 1973, Kappen is also being investigated for the murder of Maureen Malky, who was aged 23 and was strangled and killed in 1976. There were also several sexual assaults in areas he lived in and worked in that are being investigated to see if there's a connection. Joseph Kappen had been Wales' first serial killer. 
Cold case detective Dr. Colin Dark said in a statement to media, after all these years of questions, suppositions and heartaches to the girls' families, we got our man at last. Thank you for joining us on this journey into the depths of unsolved mysteries. Cold cases not only challenge our understanding of the past, but also ignite our curiosity and determination for answers. Remember to subscribe to stay updated on our latest investigations. And if you have any information regarding the cases we've covered, don't hesitate to reach out. Together, we can shed light on the shadows of the past and bring closure to those who seek it. Until next time, stay vigilant, stay curious, and never stop seeking the truth.